Uh, it doesn't look like that, but I'm quite a shy person. Uh, so I'm actually quite glad that most of the people went uh, home already. So this uh, resembles a nice small meetup and I'm less nervous. Uh, this is, this is uh, a page I created and I wanted to have it here while you are coming here because it's an amazing page. But uh, my talk is uh, about something completely different. Uh, it's called, because web API testing should be easy. Uh, but the thing is, when uh, I was about to prepare for this talk, I realized I, I hate how the talk uh, is, is done. And I rewrote it and recreated it, so it's much, much better. But uh, the thing is, it's about something uh, completely different. Uh, and it should be called like design APIs for humans and test what you promised. Uh, but I hope you won't uh, lynch me here for this and you will listen to me as well. So I'm Honza and uh, I'm involved a lot of uh, things uh, around Python in the Czech uh, Python community. I started some meetups, uh, then I helped to PyCon CZ to, to happen uh, and I helped the pilots and so on. So uh, this is like half of my time and the other half I work for Apiary which was recently uh, acquired by Oracle and we do what we do is we create tools for web API uh, developers mainly tools for uh, to to design the API in a better way uh, if you if you ask uh, okay this is half of your time and this is the other half of your time, uh, when do you actually live? Uh, that's what I'm trying to figure out for several years and I'll let you know when I figure out. <laughs> so this looks like uh, this talk is going to be about APIs. So what is actually API? Uh, API is an interface. The, the I is the most important letter uh, in the abbreviation and when we speak about APIs, we can use this, uh, this abbreviation in different contexts. And as we are Python developers, uh, we, we can use it in a, in a context as an interface of a library. I install library from PyPI and it has a public, uh, public interface, so that's, that's an API. We can use it uh, as uh, we can, we can uh, API can stand for uh, interface for sys of system. Uh, that means I have uh, a service and it gives me some means I can remotely uh, request some data or information from the service. And that's also a public interface. That's again, API. For instance, uh, a GitHub has an API so I can uh, I can ask GitHub to get me information about repository, uh, like meta information about repository for Django. Or Czech National Bank has a very simple API uh, which, which gives you current exchange rates. And it's nothing sophisticated, it's actually just a text file which they put there on their server and it has a URL, you can request it and you can use it from your from your program and you have this public API, right? The, the problem is that most people, like when we speak about systems and libraries, uh, it sounds like the API is something very technical and something which connects machines. But the thing is that uh, in fact, it's more about users because it's, Every API is a an user interface. Uh, it looks like we, we work with machines, but at the end, it's the, the client developer who comes and tries to use the library or use the, use the service and reads the documentation about the API and tries to you know, write the code which glues it together and, and gets the data. And that means when we are writing or designing APIs, we are de designing something which will be used by a human. For instance, uh, look at this piece of code. This is 
uh, how you do uh, an HTTP request uh, from Python with a standard library. The people who designed this, uh, this library, this interface, uh, didn't think much about how people will use the library. And it has, like, it has a lot of features. You can do anything you want with it. But uh, you don't want to do it when you look at it. Like, you don't want to write a code like this. And then there is a well-known library requests from Kenneth Race, or originally from Kenneth Race. It has a large community now. And the API of the library looks like this. And just by a glance of eye, because you're humans as well as the humans who use the interface, you can see that uh, this, kind of, this kind of interface is something uh, you want to use. It's something which might be actually fun to use and which solves your problem. The previous interface also was probably solving your problem, but it would take you 10 minutes just to realize whether it actually solves the problem and how to use it, and, and you wouldn't like to write it. So this really matters. And Kenneth Raids, author of requests, uh, says like, yeah, your API is a user, user interface, and you shouldn't forget about it. So how did Kenneth do it? Like, if we want to design our own uh, library with an API or web API, our own interface, we probably want to be, uh, we want to learn from Kenneth. We want to do, do it in a way he did it, because his work is awesome, right? So I asked him on Twitter, and uh, I don't know how he did, because he didn't reply, but... Uh, <laughs> yet. Uh, but I have some educated guesses. So I'll give you some pointers how probably he did. So how do you design interface like in a really good way? You can write tests. Uh, the thing is, when you are writing a test, you, you become the user of your library. You happen to be in the role of the end user, of the, of the person who is going to use your code when, when it's ready. So you write te test like this, you instance a request, and you, know, you use the interface. And you can very easily imagine how the person feels when uses your library. So. The thing is, you have to write a test first. Only when you write it first, it helps to design the interface. Because when you do it the other way, you just write the code in a way uh, which fits structuring your code. You write the code, and you have these functions, you know, and, and then when you're writing tests, you just take these functions and test whether they behave as you, as you want it. Whether they, when you feed them with some arguments, they return what you want. And you don't think about the interface anymore. It's just there. But when you write the test first, without the implementation, you have the time to think how you actually design the, the interface and how it feels. So when you write a code like this in the test. You, you're thinking about the interface, then you run the test, it's read, it, you don't have the implementation, then you implement it, and you run the test again, it's green. This way, you can design the interface, and you can first think about it. Can we bring this to another step? Like, what if we write down the behavior first? We can have a text file like this. It's just a plain text file. But it's, you can see that it's a bit structured. It's in a language called Kerkin. And it's basically behavior scenarios. 
the great thing on this is that this is readable by everyone. You can put it into, into version control. You can send it by email. And even the person who can't code can read this, and you can have a discussion with the person. You can agree on how certain thing can work. And then you can go. And the best thing is that you can attach tests to these lines, and you can test it. So this is like machine readable and human readable at the same time. And you have single source of truth. It's you have one specification which says how something behaves. And it's for both discussion and design and for testing. So you can ensure that your implementation actually is according to what you promised, what you, what you agreed. So it's testable documentation. That's, that's like the best thing you can, you can get. It's, it's bulletproof. Two in one, like the shampoos. And then there is another thing. You know, the, the, Gherkin, the Gherkin scenarios are great, but it's sometimes a lot of like overhead. You, you, can, you want to do it on large projects and so on, but when you have a small library or a small API, you, you don't want to bother with 10 scenarios and then map the, the code with the, uh, with, the, with the lines in the scenarios and so on. But there is one approach which is really great and really simple, and it's RDD, the readme-driven development. It's from this article. I have it here open, Tom Preston Werner. It's quite old, but I think it still applies. And it says that you just write your readme first. You go and write the, the essential documentation for your project. That means you, you're, not, you're not writing a full-fledged documentation like you know the whole docs with all the cases and so on, and you spend a week writing docs and then go to coding. No, you just write the readme, the, the, the most essential uh, information about the library, about the code you're going to write, about the interface, and you have a code examples there, so you, you're just writing a text, and at the same time, you're designing the interface. And even though the library doesn't exist yet, you can take this file, go to your colleagues, discuss with them, hey, would you like this interface? They can say, oh, well, this parameter. And you can iterate on top of it, right? So. This has several like benefits. You have the chance to ch think through the project first and through the interface first. Then one big benefit for all the programmers is, or all the programmers which are different than me because I like to write documentation, but you know, when you get the coding and you get the library ready, you already have the docs done. You don't have to write them retrospectively, which is what Nobody likes to do. So you actually have, have it already. It's there. And your team can use the interface before it exists. Because when you agree, like, yeah, it will look like this. I'll just go now and implement it. But they have the essential interface. They have the readme. And they can already use your library. Like, they can mock it, mock it in their tests, or I don't know. And you can develop it in sort of like parallel which is definitely like useful. And it's easy to discuss the interface with everyone, readable. And it's like concrete thing. They can almost like touch it. It's, it's, it's not like you're having discussion at the water cooler with your colleague and explaining him, oh, what if it was doing this and that? No, you have to read me. It's there. And you can read it as, as if it was like real uh, project. And the interface in the README is, as I said, essential interface user expects. It's your promise. This will work. 
like whatever is behind readme it's like additional features and so on and that's something which can be broken and needs fixes or not implemented yet but whatever you promote in readme that's, that's the essential thing like it's like this library is to solve this and uh, I promise it it has this interface so the readme must not get out of sync with code because then you break the promise and it's like all wrong you just it it's it's step missing there you know you you promise something you design it first then you implement it and then you actually have no way to say well i implemented what i actually designed so how do we ensure implementation matches the design well we can ensure it by testing the documentation in a similar way as the Gherkin works, we want to have the bulletproof two in one here. We have testable documentation. Python has this built in doc test module, which can go extract the code examples from your readme and then run your library and match and, and test whether, whether the code examples uh, and the reality actually like matches. And this is amazing because then you can actually rely on the fact that you, what you promised in your readme and what you designed, that it's what you implemented. So you can write the readme, you can agree on the interface with your users or colleagues or whatever, and then you have this test which ensures that it won't pass until the interface is fulfilled as it was promised. And if you want to keep it like that forever, you can put this into continuous integration. And if, if you break it in the future, uh, you will break the build and tests won't pass and bye bye, you have to fix it. And just imagine what if we could design and test web APIs like this? Wouldn't it be like great? So the thing is that you can. You can have a markdown file, the same, almost the same format like your readme, and you describe your API like, like that. In simple words, it has some sort of structure, but you can say like, hey, get me this endpoint, and it's, you can write there in plain text like what, it, what is it good for, what is the response, what is the status code, and what you get, and so on. And it's an actual format. It's, it's API Blueprint, and it's just markdown file. It feels like README, and it's human readable, machine readable. And the machine readable part is very important because then you can take a tool called Dread and test your web API against the, the designed interface. So you have document, it's a single source of truth. Yeah, so this, this Dread tool is, uh, is open source, it's, it's, it's a library. You just install it, you can run it in your console. And it supports multiple languages uh, for like to, to be extended with. And you can put it into continuous integration. So, and again, you can ensure that the the contract is is all right it's 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 kept so what happens here you have the document you 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 design the interface there you design it before you start encoding you can discuss the interface and the document is just plain markdown and while it's plain markdown, you can still parse it and do several things with it. Like you can generate HTML documentation from it. You can generate mocks for the users of the interface to use it before it actually is implemented. So they can give you feedback. And you can, you can test the implementation, whether it fits the design interface and ensure that the implementation 
is according to what you promised and what you agreed on. And this is what we do in Apiary and how, like, what, 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 what our tools like help you with. But the concept is Im important on itself. So testing implementation against design allows you designing before implementing, because then you can keep the promise. Designing before implementing allows you better design. And the dread tool allows you better design in this way. And I have demo. I don't have much time, but I'll try to speed it up. So, I'll install Dread, which is itself in JavaScript, but it doesn't matter. matter. And let's create a simple API here. So let's start with something like this. Uh, my, that's some kind of header. But now I just like cats API. And let's say this API allows you to get various cats, which is amazing because internet is full, full of cats. Get cats. And now I have like response two hundred JSON, JSON, and here I have like example of response. So let's have cat called Schrodinger, Schrodinger's cat. Or cat called uh, Garfield, and let's give it a color. It's just an example. And let's see. I save it. So I have this API MD markdown file. So I have this markdown file and I designed an API. I didn't think about it much, but uh, when you design an API, you should. You, you, you will have more time. Uh, and now I'll try to like implement the API and test it. So I have Dread here and the API. I don't have any implementation yet, so I uh, I'll start start with something, and I'll I'll use Flask, which is simple uh, framework for Python. I'm not very good in remembering things, so I just take their read uh, hello world example. So. Uh, yeah. Oh, well, oh, that doesn't matter. So I have this hello world example. And that's my implementation of the API. Well, doesn't look like, but that's how it works uh, with testing first. So I'll, I'll run. I'll run, yeah. I'll run my implementation. Uh, uh, API MD, right? What was it? Localhost five hundred. Yeah. Now, yeah, 
now I tested that my implementation doesn't fit the design, right? I can see that status code is not, is not 200 because it's requesting cats in my API. There's no, in my implementation, there is no endpoint cats and so on. And the content type doesn't, doesn't match and so on. So the implementation isn't, isn't really good. So let's change it. And I'll just take whatever I have here and I'll put it into a very sophisticated database. <laughs> and I'll use JSON if I, oh, yeah. So like this. So let's see whether my implementation now fits the contract. Ah. Well, I'm lost. Help me. Ah. <laughs> okay, works. <laughs> and I don't have I, I don't have much time, right? Okay, okay, so I want, to, I, want to, I want to show you how we can use actually like Python to extend this kind of behavior because this is, this is a default behavior. You might uh, wonder uh, if, you, if you change uh, Garfield to something else, uh, yeah, it will smartly test the thing, like it, it doesn't do one-to-one -one check, it, 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 it tests the, the structure and so on. Uh, and if you want to extend this default behavior, uh, you want you can use various languages, and one of them is Python, and you can do that by yeah. Let's see. I will have a simple authentication here. Let's say if yeah, I need request here. Request if request header called oh well. Authentication isn't uh, super secret token. Um, I'll abort that the user can't access the endpoint. Otherwise, I'll provide him with the data. And this is something which is not very easily, uh, uh, you can't very easily describe it in the contract because you can uh, tell user that, yeah, there is authentication header, uh, but you can easily test it this way. You can put the actual token usually, like I could put my super secret token there, but uh, when you have real application, uh, it, the token changes and you can't just put it into the documentation because it's it's, uh, it's a secret thing. So you, you want to attach a token uh, to your calls, to, to Dread's calls. So you install Dread hooks in Python and now I can create another file. Uh, which is like import, oh, import hooks as hooks. Before each, uh, and I'll add my super secret token request headers. Uh, equals my super secret token, which is this one. Like this. So I have, I have, now I wrote a simple hook file which extends the behavior of Dread. 
before each request, this function will be run, and the transaction with Dread does to test the server uh, will be modified by this my code, which which adds HTTP header with some super secret token. And when I run this thing, uh, it's wrong. And I don't know why. Yeah, because I have the file wrong. Okay, now it should be okay. Request, okay, another mistake. Now it passes. Okay, I made some mistakes in the hook file, but uh, the thing is you can uh, if I didn't do this, it would fail because the, the server uh, wants me to, to, to pass the authentication header. So this way I can extend the behavior. And that's all. Well, it's not. I have one special file, this slide here, which says remember. <laughs> Think first. Design first, doc first, test first. Basically anything, do anything first before you start coding. <laughs> it's good for you, it's good for health. <laughs> Discuss the interface design before implementing it. Use the interface before implementing it. And have your interface design as a single source of truth. Strive for having testable documentation, because then you can ensure that what you promise is fulfilled. And yeah, test implementation against the design. And I think that's it. Yeah, that's my company. If you want to work with me, let me know. And I have stickers. <laughs> it's been great. Um, there's a number of questions that you got. Okay, the one with the most upvotes, uh, if I see right. Um, XML or JSON or something else? I guess uh, whether, whether XML uh, is supported format for, for testing like this. Uh, well, the JSON support is, uh, is uh, like the, the, the largest. Uh, XML but basically, you can you can put examples of any payload there. So you can put text plane there. You can put XML there, uh, and it will work. You can test it. But uh, the the smart com comparison, uh, which is implemented there, uh, isn't ready for XML very much. But since you can you can uh, extend the the testing process. With uh, with your own like you can do your own assertions and so on. You could easily use this and and uh, match like the the bodies uh, according to your needs. Uh, and Red will do at least the rest like the status codes and, and all this. So yeah, it's possible. It's not completely out of the box at the moment. And more generally, for APIs, um, would you use XML? JSON, YAML, like that. something else? Mm, that depends. Uh, like I, I would use JSON for most of the APIs, but if I'm, I don't know, if I'm doing an API where I'm sharing, uh, I don't know, uh, like uh, G, uh, GPS data, there are like standards like GP, GPX or KML or something like that. So it would be like why to invent something else when there is standard which is XML and that makes more most sense and you have most tooling for it and so on. So depending on the consumer. Yeah. Yeah. Any thoughts? Oh, this is a little tougher one. Any thoughts on working for a company that has reputation often described in very negative terms that is Oracle? <laughs> well, uh, that's, uh, I would say that's a Le challenge. Please know this is being recorded, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that, that's, that's a challenge. Uh, of course, it's like uh, uh, 
it's it depends like it's uh some negative pr and sometimes positive pr it's like uh yeah for for me it's a challenge uh like let's uh uh let's show that uh uh, let, let, let's let's teach the big company that so you can do things in a different way. <laughs> we, we will not grill you on this one anymore. Okay. <laughs> uh, your favorite documentation framework besides comments and README? Uh, besides comments and README. Documentation. Okay. Uh, well. Um, for instance, on Dread, uh, I have documentation. And uh, I use currently there's mkdocs and it's hosted on Python uh, on a read uh, read the docs. And uh, I like Markdown for its simplicity, uh, but I like restructured text for its uh, like for its features and how it can interlink things and and have these warning blocks and so on. So I. I'm a bit like torn between those two because not many people out of the Python community know restructured text, but Sphinx and read uh, and uh, and read the docs and all this it's completely amazing. Uh, and but you know Markdown is uh, is mm, then you need other tools or Sphinx supports Markdown. But it's you know it's like half the features and it's not very good and especially if you host Markdown on Read the Docs, they the also there's like 20 issues which are like oh well we don't support it that much. So my my favorite would be Sphinx uh, and more feature rich Markdown or something like because it's like it's better for contributions. Like if people come and they see a restructured text, they often get scared and run away. But I don't know. Thank you. Next question: uh, Will GraphQL replace REST APIs? I'll try to keep it short. <laughs> uh, let's say uh, we had this soap and and uh, and uh, and. Thing, which was like basically uh, you created something on the server and and you didn't care much about your consumer and mo sometimes even like with rest approach and with uh, with HDB uh, like JSON and this this thing uh, people design it in a way they just design it like oh this is how we want to build the API and you use it and we don't care how you, you use it and if it's if it's good for you and GraphQL, I take it as a, as a like a revolt from all the client developers, which say, no, now you will listen. You just give me what I need, and we don't care how you cache it or how you find the data. I I just send you a query, and you just get me the data, and and it's that's good for me. And that can be good for some scenarios, uh, but I think. Mm, it would be better if the two sides could just speak to each other and create APIs which are good for both the server developers and the client developers, and not like, well, I don't speak to you. Give me, give me the data this way. So the uh, the ultimate answer is, in my ideal world, uh, we would stay with uh, well-designed REST APIs. Uh, and at the same time, I think GraphQL is a good innovation, and it can live alongside uh, REST APIs. It's like WebSockets is also a different kind of API, and it's good for different things, and it perfectly lives alongside REST APIs. It's not replacing it or something. So in, so in other words, the transition that we saw from SOAP to REST APIs, uh, pretty much, hmm. uh, you do not see a similar thing happening here. You think more like the, the, these two. Well, it can happen. I'm not like uh, Nostradamus, but uh, <laughs> I, I hope it will live like together alongside each other. Okay, thank you. Uh, how do you persuade the developers to keep the README in sync in sync with the code? By tests. Yep. That, that was the presentation was about. Yep. 
<laughs> By the way, this was asked at the very beginning, so that's probably yeah, yeah, yeah. why the question <laughs> yeah. was asked. Uh, another one, why is Dread called Dread? The GitHub README does not seem to address that. Okay, uh, well, Dread is called Dread because there is this cool comics called Dread, and it's uh, uh, a badass uh, judge cop from dystopian future which uh, just comes to you and judges and executes you on the street because there's no time. There's so much crime in the future. There's no time for real like uh, trials. <laughs> so uh, you better listen to the law and and don't get dread angry. And the the this movie. There are two movies about it, and this movie is really good. And the uh, older one is, I think it's with Sylvester Stallone, and that one is quite fun, too. <laughs> you could have a hook, you know, if someone has a, a test that fails, it, w it would do something, you know, like delete a random file or something <laughs> you know, to punish that person for. <laughs> I am the law. Another one. <laughs> is it possible to use Dread with binary output formats like protocol buffers? Oh well, not not really, not yet. <laughs> we uh, I have still open issues about images, so uh, something more complicated <laughs> is is uh, would bring me a, a sleepless night. But uh, uh, yeah, we but basically uh, binary. That's that's difficult because uh, you have to test it probably by hooks because uh, you can't really easily declaratively write it into the specification of the API. And uh, well, yeah, and we have to at least ensure that you can go around this limitation uh, in hooks. Mm -hmm. What do you think about HAL, probably referring to hypertext application language, but I could be wrong. Uh, isn't it an overkill? Well, uh, I, I like hypermedia. Uh, Hull is one of the like basic implementations or, or like formats to use it for hypermedia, and uh, I I would probably choose different formats, but uh, for hypermedia. But at the same time, I can see that Hull is one of the like simplest approaches, and it's like uh, there is most tooling, but. Uh, I think I think Hull doesn't give you the full power of Hypermedia because it, Hypermedia is about links and forms and, and all the things and Hull has just half of it. So um, if you go like full Hypermedia and you try to find a format which will gives you which will give you all the power Hypermedia offers you, you might not consider it overkill because you get all the benefits. Uh, but if you go just with how, you can end up just with you know uh, uh, responses full of links, and it might seem like overkill. Mm -hmm. And uh, are you planning to include a way to write comments in Apiary? That's a question about Apiary. Oh, like. uh, no, not really, because uh, we we want this to happen. Uh, in different places. Like basically we have GitHub integration and in an ideal world we would have integrations with other uh, others like software where you could uh, discuss the code, version the code and so on. Like, I don't know, there's not just GitHub but you know, Bitbucket, we would have the integration for ages if they had commit API and that's a different story. Another one. Thanks. This was this was very eye-opening. And another question about binary formats, which you already answered. So, thanks. This was very eye-opening. Um, and the very last one. Any thoughts on Swagger or OAI? Uh, yeah, it's supported in Dread. <laughs> but uh, uh, in my opinion, uh, well, this this Swagger community is uh, originally uh, very like oriented on a different way to approach this. Uh, that's like I write code and I generate the docs from the code, which is uh, uh, which goes completely against this like design first approach. 
and they are trying to be designed first uh, as well today. But uh, for me, it's much uh, easier to design uh, an interface by writing a human readable document and discuss the, the design than to write a YAML or JSON file and you know go going this way. But like if somebody needs it for like integration and so on, well, yeah, it's supported. You can you can test uh, your API described in Swagger by Dread as well. <laughs>